Yeah, uh, today is the 30th April 2020. So it's a great pleasure to, uh, to welcome Professor Grassara Poso from Institute Curie in Paris in the Web EV Talk series. So Grassa is a world known expert in the field of extraterrestrial vesicles. She is one of the first scientists that believe in the existence of exosomes. She also demonstrated the endosomal origin of melanosomes which is known to be very important in pigmentation. And her lab also dissected the cellular machinery needed for the construction of endosomes, multifascicular bodies, and lysosomes, how they are maintained, uh, which then lead into the secretion as extracellular vesicles. So her work has been recognized widely and published in multiple high impact factors. So it is uh, a great honor and without further ado, I'd like to welcome Grasa to present her lecture on the cell biology of extracellular vesicles from immunity to pigmentation. Hi everyone, I'm happy to be here this morning, this morning, this afternoon. Uh, I mean, good evening to some of you. And uh, I mean, I would love to have you in front of myself, as you can imagine. But uh, I'm just talking, as I say, to the box, but I know that you are many on the other side and uh, I, I would be glad to, uh, to answer questions in the, at the end. I mean, uh, it is a little bit less interactive, but still, I mean, I'll be happy to, when I'm here with you and uh, I hope to do it a little bit informally. And, uh, but still, I mean, I'd like to, to tell you today a little bit of a story. I mean, the story of the cell biology of exocellular vesicles, from where we started, uh, where are we going? And of course, I mean, uh, uh, at the end, I mean, well, uh, I hope we can have a nice discussion and open questions. Um, so indeed, uh, I mean, two of my, uh, uh, my stars, I mean, I have many stars, but two of my stars are really Rose Johnston and Phil Stahl. And uh, Rose Johnston and Phil Stahl, I mean, they, they were a great inspiration also, I mean, for all of the work that uh, I've been doing and that my team has been doing all over these years. And uh, as we always say, I mean, and some of you know already these, uh, these slides, you know, it's just uh, for, for me, uh, this is a Photoshop, and the, the Photoshop was done by a great colleague of myself, Guillaume Vanille, that many of you know. And uh, Guillaume, I mean, we, uh, we just said it's true that uh, Rose Johnston and, uh, and Phil Stahl are for us a little bit like the, the Padawans, I mean, the beginning of the story. And um, I think that for now, I mean, uh, we feel whole like the kind of the, we are the Avenger. Uh, um, generation and we really need to go forward and we go forward I mean uh, hopefully all together on the same line and trying to find I mean consensus and uh, and it changing and uh, with uh, also facing all the challenges that we have today. So uh, basically uh, it's true that uh, Phil Stahl and, uh, at the University of St. Louis and Rose Johnson at McGill, basically at the same time, they were, uh, both teams were really working on the, on the trafficking of the transferrin receptor. But the trafficking of the transferrin receptor in a, in a special cell, the reticulocyte, and as you know, the reticulocyte, I mean, during differentiation into erythrocytes, needs to get rid of the transferring receptor, as many other activities. And uh, so what they found is that in these reticulocytes, I mean, and as you see here, I hope you can see my cursor, you have the transferring receptor that is internalized into clutching coated vesicles. And generally this transferring receptor leaves the transferrin and the iron, and then it goes uh, back to the plasma membrane. This is in, in most cells. In the case of the reticulocytes, then this transferring receptor, what they found is that it gets trapped into these intraluminal vesicles uh, of an endosomal compartment. And that these endosomal compartments, they then fuse with the plasma membrane and release 
with intraluminal vesicles with the transferrin receptor. And uh, so this, this is a, a model that was adapted from one of the first uh, papers by Cliff Harding, and that was then uh, taken again in this very nice historical review by Phil Stahl, Cliff Harding, and John Hoyser in June of Cell Biology. Sorry, it goes a little bit fast. So uh, basically, uh, the team of Rose Johnston uh, and also Phil Stahl, I mean, then they provided evidence that, uh, I mean, electro, uh, electron microscopic evidence that these uh, endosomal like compartments that you can see here with these intraluminal vesicles, and here you see these gold particles labeling the transferrin receptor. Uh, they found this evidence for this exocytic fusion of the multivesicular endosome, uh, releasing these intraluminal vesicles with the transferring receptor labeled by the gold particles. And this paper, I mean, by, by Penn, that uh, was a student of Rod Johnson, was really one of these uh, first electron microscopic evidence for the externalization of the transferring receptor in this vesicular form in sheep reticular sites. And it's true that in these mid 80s, uh, I mean, it, it was against the dogma of the recycling of the transferring receptor. But this was a particular cell, this was the reticular site. And uh, the teams pursued working on these cells. And they basically, they really, what they found is that there's a, a lot uh, of other plasma membrane activity that are released uh, by these means of uh, releasing of vesicles derived from endosomes. And so, therefore, I mean, this is one of the first papers where they associated the name exosomes to these vesicles that were endosome derived. Of course, we always need to remind that the name exosome has been used before by other colleagues, but was not truly associated with the fact that uh, these vesicles were derived from endosomes. In this case, there was this proof by electron microscopy that these the vesicles were endosome derived. And therefore, what they did was that they, they, they could isolate these vesicles by uh, centrifugation at 100,000 G for around 90 minutes. And they characterized the activities that could then be released by the, by the vesicles and therefore allowing the, the differentiation of reticulocytes into erythrocytes. So it, it was an important process, but indeed it was a process of release of obsolete molecules. So basically Rose Johnston, I mean, uh, she, she was extremely excited always about, uh, about these findings. And when uh, other researchers uh, started really finding that other cells could also release these endosome derived vesicles, then she really uh, became hyper enthusiastic because in the beginning she said, okay, I mean, we showed that this, this, in these reticulocytes, the transferrin receptor is released. Uh, reticulocytes can get rid of many molecules associated with these vesicles. Uh, maybe it is like a trash, but in this case, I mean, maybe other cells can use this process for other purposes. And it's true that then uh, when, when we had the first meeting in 2005, organized by Rose Johnson and McGill, and we were about 25, it's true that uh, she told us, and I really like the expression of this Alice in the Blunderland approach that she used. And uh, why appeared against the dogma? I have something written in my screen, in my screen that appears against the dogma. But, uh, and uh, full, uh, that the full knowledge of the contribution of exosomes to intercellular information transmission and the potential medical application of this knowledge will depend on the ingenuity of future investigators and their insight into biological processes. 
I think it was, I mean, we were in 2005. I mean, now we are in 2020. And you see that uh, finally, uh, basically 15 years uh, ago, I mean, we, we still didn't really knew what these vesicles were doing. So uh, basically myself, I mean, uh, how, how did I came into really uh, studying uh, exosomes and now other extracellular vesicles? Uh, so what are the pathways uh, for MHC class to transfer to the plasma membrane? So at the time I was a postdoc in the, in the team of Hans Reuse in the Netherlands, in Utrecht, in the Utrecht Medical Center. And uh, one of my projects were really to understand how the major histocompatibility molecules, uh, class two molecules that are expressed in the lymphocytes, in dendritic cells, can be transported to the plasma membrane. And here what you see, I mean, this is an EM uh, of a dendritic cell, and you see here the T cells, these are immunological synapses. I mean, I use this EM that uh, we have made in the team a long time ago, but I use it somehow as a cartoon just to show that here you have these MHC class two molecules in red. We have the bound peptide in green. And these molecules, uh, they are expressed at the plasma membrane to present antigenic peptides to T cells and to start immune responses. Although we knew already at the time in the early 90s by the studies of Peter Peters, together with the team of uh, Hide Plouch and, uh, and together with Jack Nafshes in, uh, in the lab of Hans Reuser, is that uh, these molecules, uh, these molecules, they, they are present in compartments that have all the features of late endosomes, the so-called multivesicular bodies or multivesicular endosomes, and uh, lysosome-like compartments. And these compartments were called that the uh, MHC class two compartments, class two compartments. They were they had all the features of these acidic compartments uh, containing indeed uh, lysosomal hydrolases. Although in these compartments, the MHC class two molecules were not degraded. They were not degraded. So somehow there should be a way for these molecules to be transported to the plasma membrane. So this was one of my projects at the time. And uh, it, was, it was not so clear how really molecules that could be present in these degradative compartments could be then transported. Uh, away and uh, escape degradation to be expressed at the plasma membrane. So, uh, because I mean, uh, I always think, I mean, that we need to combine a lot of techniques, but seeing is believing. So, here, what you see here on the left, you have these MHC class two compartments, the gold particles, sorry, label. Uh, the MHC class two molecules. Here, what you have, you have uh, the multivesicular endosome with BSA coupled to gold that was previously internalized into the cell. And here, you're on your right, what you can see is that you have a plasma membrane, and then you have these vesicles that appear to be released into the extracellular space. And here, this is the extracellular space. And you see here that the BSA coupled to gold is re-externalized together with these intraluminal vesicles in this so-called exocytic profile. So this, in this case, this fusion profile is defined by the presence of externalized BSA gold that was previously endocytosed by the cell. So, I mean, uh, so here it's Hans Reuser and Willem Storfel, a great biochemist that uh, was working on the other side of the corridor. And uh, together, I mean, we start really thinking, you know, going to the library and saying, okay, 
I mean, these really appear like uh, these vesicles that are released by reticulocytes that uh, Rose Johnson and Phil Skull uh, reported uh, some years ago. So this was about uh, 10, years, uh, 10 years after the, the studies on reticulocytes. And what we did is to use the same methods that were used uh, by the two teams, we collected the vesicles present in the supernatants of B lymphoma cells. We collected them and we deposited on EM grids. And here you see the small vesicles that we can label then with antibodies against MHG class two that are then detected with gold particles. And we then we did, the, of course, this was after uh, differential ultracentrifugation. And what you can see here in these blots is that the vesicles can be recovered. I mean, this is labeling for MHC class two on this Western blot. The vesicles are recovered at 70,000 G. At 10,000 G, you still see a little signal, of course, because you have maybe a little clumps of vesicles or even, I mean, larger vesicles, more dense vesicles. And here, this, the majority of the, the MHC class two molecules are recovered at 70,000 G after one hour. So, and here, this is a, a, a sucrose gradient showing that these are vesicles because they're, this, they float. And this was important to show that if they float is because they are vesicles and we compared in parallel pieces of membrane that actually don't float into the gradients. So uh, this is just to cut a long story short. This is one of the protocols that uh, we that, so that we used at the time, and this was uh, this this was published, of course, in the in this paper in Journal of uh, Experimental Medicine, but also then in a con in a compiled protocol made by Clotilde Terry, Albert Clayton, Sebastian Nigoren, and myself in 2006, where Indeed, we, we presented this differential ultracentrifugation and then the characterization by morphology, biochemistry, mass spectrometry, electron microscopy. But I think I'll come a little bit later into these uh, challenges of the isolation and the purification of vesicles. Of course, what I'd like to note here is that normally when we use these kind of techniques, of course, we always describe very often the vesicles like as they are cup shaped. Indeed, they, they seem like a very small reticulocyte, a small erythrocyte, sorry. But uh, this is just an artifact of the fixation and the staining with the heavy metals. And uh, when we look at them by cryomicroscopy in a close to native state, so they are just. Uh, slab frozen and observed by cryo-electron microscopy, and this is from a paper from uh, Guillaume Vanille in 2015, uh, we show here that the vesicles, these bilayered vesicles, they are perfectly round. So uh, basically, I mean, what, uh, when we did the studies in B cells, what we, what we showed uh, indeed was that there was vesicles, the HMG class two molecules appear to have associated peptides, but we were still unconvinced on whether these vesicles could be functional or not. And what we did in collaboration with the, with the team of uh, Case Malif in Leiden, and together with a PhD student at the time, Hans Neumann, uh, was to put in contact uh, either cells, either uh, exosomes isolated from the supernatants of these cells that were primed, of course, with antigenic peptides. And what you can see here in the, in the lower panel is that these vesicles can really also stimulate uh, T cell proliferation in the absence of cells. So this for us was quite really interesting because that, I mean, if the vesicles, if they are functional, uh, it's because maybe uh, it's not only uh, the way for these uh, B lymphocytes to get rid of the excess of MHC class two molecules. 
So what we did is that uh, finally we did speculated in the paper that maybe these vesicles could be used somehow as uh, natural liposomes to stimulate anti-tumoral immune responses. Of course, I think uh, we were a bit uh, a bit skeptical about putting these. Uh, uh, this conclusion in, in a manuscript without really any proof, but I mean, why not? And uh, I think that finally uh, it was a good idea because uh, it opened then uh, the path, I mean, for really further investigations. And I think that for her, since we are cell biologists, we are working at the bench, we are working on the microscopes, and I think that's really one of our goals is to find the way to, to go to the bad side. And indeed, when, when I came back to Paris in uh, 1995, uh, after a, a great, a great, a gorgeous postdoc in the team of uh, Hans Reuser, and together with Willem Storvoch also, it was really to, to try to interact with uh, physicians and uh, colleagues interested in, um, in clinical trials and trying to find new uh, immunotherapy protocols. And uh, together with Sebastian Amigorena, that, was at, that is at Institut Curie still, and together with Laurence de Vogel at Institut Gustave Roussy, what we did is that first to prove that dendritic cells could also secrete uh, exosomes or vesicles that have these features of these endosome related vesicles. And then load these vesicles with uh, antigenic peptides, I mean, with the tumor peptides in particular, and then inject it into different mice, I mean, with, uh, with different uh, tumor models. And in one case, indeed, what uh, Laurent saw is what was that there was a slowdown of tumor growth. And in another case, in the case of the mastocytoma, it was a complete tumor eradication. So basically this study that was published then in 1998, opened the way to, to go then to, to clinical trials. And uh, I'm sure that you, you are all aware of these, uh, of many, many papers now, and uh, even how these clinical trials uh, can be done, I mean, uh, using, uh, in fact, uh, dendritic cells that are derived from the patients. You can, one can isolate uh, uh, vesicles from the supernatants of these cells, and then these vesicles are then re-injected into the patient. And this is from uh, Journal of Clinical Investigation uh, Review. And this is from uh, a paper in Journal of Extracellular Vesicles, where you have different examples of so-called EV-based clinical trials. So to get a long story short, uh, it's true that we went from the eradication of obsolete molecules to T-cell stimulation, uh, clinical trials, uh, basically in lung cancer, melanoma. But now we know that these exosomes are secreted by many, many, many different cells. Uh, they can, you know, they have been shown, I mean, this is really very, very, very few examples, I mean, of uh, how exosomes, how extracellular vesicles can be involved, I mean, in so many processes, I mean, from parasite growth transmission, tissue regeneration, transmission of pathogens, and our team, I mean, was one of the first contributing showing that indeed prions are associated with exosomes and could be disseminated uh, via exosomes. Also, ex very nice examples of, of the role of exosomes in communication in the central nervous system. And uh, I mean, that this has been really uh, uh, summarized in uh, different uh, reviews that we have written recently, but also by many, many other colleagues. 
So it's true, as I said, um, I always like to, to show this slide because there is this growing interest, as you all know, for extracellular vesicles and the field uh, was really bumping. So we started to deal with reticulocytes, exosomes in antigen presenting cells, exosomes that stimulate anti-tumoral immune responses here. The, the first reports by the, the team of Jan Lutbal showing that there is microRNAs on exosomes. Also, this was extremely important to show that this genetic material in exosomes, and it was, again, another bump in the field. And here, we are growing and growing. And so, and since the first meeting in 2005 in Montreal, then we had a workshop, the international workshop on extracellular, on exosomes and extracellular vesicles organized by myself and put it there in Paris where we had already 200 attendees. It was somehow a tribute to Rose Johnson, who unfortunately had passed away already at the time. And then there was the launching of the International Society for Extracellular Vesicles, and the first president is Jan Lutwald, and thanks again, Jan, for everything you, you have done, and you have moved, and you have started, and the society is now great. And you see that every year, there is uh, this annual meeting with several parallel section, sessions and over 1,000 attendees. Unfortunately, this year, as you know, I mean, the Philadelphia was canceled. I mean, uh, many of us uh, were stopped to go and uh, we had already meetings organized over there, but uh, we hope that next year we'll still have a great meeting and we hope to continue, of course, making the society living through webinars and web conferences for the moment. So uh, I always like to, to, to show this picture of Dave Carter, another great colleague from Oxford Brookes University, UK, because he's extremely excited about uh, exosomes and extracellular vesicles. And this is just a plot, I mean, from PubMed, just to show you, I mean, uh, how the, a, a little bit the distribution of uh, in the different fields of how EVs have been really implemented. I mean, in cell biology, biochemistry, neurosciences, it's enormous, but also in many, many other um, uh processes and this is the best uh sentence for for dave is that evs are really cool true that evs are cool and uh so you have of course the international society for extracellular vesicles there was the launching of the journal of extracellular vesicles and as you know i mean it's uh, the impact factor is great uh we just had an impact factor and uh, so there are very, there are national societies. And uh, as you see here, of course, there is the American society, but still you have in Germany, you have UK, you have Austrian, you have the, the, the Iberian, the Jivex, you have the Société Française, you have the Belgium, I mean, and the Netherlands and the Israel. And uh, I mean, it has been all over the world and a lot of, coordination between the different societies to organize meetings and even more focused meetings, I mean, as compared to the annual meeting of the society. So it's true that EVs are so cool that somehow we need guidelines. There are, there is this need for guidelines. So there was already some guidelines that were published in 2014. Uh, in journal of extracellular vesicles. So this year, the guidelines were um, were rewritten, and uh, because they, they really need to be continuously uh, putting um, in a, uh, updated. And uh, so this is a paper with over three hundred uh, contributors. But so this is somehow the minimal information for studies of extracellular vesicles and for all of you that uh, those of you that are really not aware, I mean, I really I would consider looking a little bit at the guidelines. 
Of course, as we always discuss, of course, we need to be still open because, I mean, there's still uh, maybe original work or many other organisms that uh, maybe won't really fit onto the guidelines, but uh, I think it's really important to, to stick to a certain uh, nomenclature ways of uh, isolating vesicles. Also, this is extremely important. And uh, this, I mean, I, I took the, uh, the freedom actually to, to, to take a slide uh, from Hallett Clayton, who was one of the first who really collaborated with us, I mean, to write these uh, current protocols in cell biology. And it's true that now the challenge still is really EV isolation, purification, and on the guidelines, I mean, there is, um, uh, there is a number of uh, sessions that are dedicated to that. So it's true that you, you start with large volumes generally, or sometimes very small volumes, this can also happen. And then uh, of course, there's always contaminants, uh, a lot of uh, lipoproteins, uh, you have the processing time, you have convenience, you have the yield, uh, throughput, the costs. I mean, there are many, many challenges then you don't, if you don't know the cells. So it's true that one of our conclusions is really no technique is perfect, but the downstream application is important. So you, you really need to characterize at the best your starting material. Uh, there are many techniques. I mean, you can go to the literature and I would really uh, advise, I mean, when you start reading the, the papers and the literature, just go to the materials and methods and look how uh, the vesicles have been uh, isolated. I think it's very, very important to really then understand uh, what, what are the results. And because of course the method can affect the outcome. So, I would say, I mean, it's true that it's always better to combine methods. Uh, in general, I mean, I just give an example of the method that we use more in routine in the, in the lab, but of course there are many others we can discuss at the end. I mean, normally we use differential ultrasivigation, knowing that it's absolutely not perfect and then we, we do in general an OptiPrep or a sucrose gradient, the daxinol. And then if needed, I mean, you can also do immunoisolation, characterized by fax, uh, characterized by nanocytes, or another type of, um, of technique that allows a little bit to, to, to have a quantitative idea of, the, of what you have uh, in your samples and uh, also an idea of the size, taking into account, I mean, that this is mostly based on diffraction and that you have uh, sometimes little clusters of vesicles that may appear as one single particle, but then of course, seeing is believing and I would always recommend to look by electron microscopy when possible. So, uh, this was a position paper that we wrote with Steve Gould. I mean, this is, was just after the, the first ICF meeting in Gothenburg because uh, we really had a, a difficulty with the nomenclature because we're calling exosomes. I was calling exosomes what was endosome derived. And then we had other type of vesicles, many other type of vesicles that are also arise for example, from the plasma membrane. So what we decided was to call them collectively extracellular vesicles. And this is a more recent uh, uh, nomenclature paper on journal of extracellular vesicles, again, by, by Ken and Clotilde. And I would also advise, I mean, reading uh, this position paper on the nomenclature. So basically, I mean, as you can see here, I mean, in, in my model, this is from a review that I wrote with Guillaume Storvolo in 2013 already. So, so here you have this endosomal system. So this is what we call these early endosomes where these 
uh, intraluminal vesicles start to be formed by uh, inward budding of the limiting membrane of the endosome. And then you have these multivesicular endosomes. Here we have depicted two multivesicular endosomes, one that is fusing with the lysosome to degrade their contents, another one that is uh, prone, I mean, it is fated for fusion with the plasma membrane. Two, that, I mean, this is still very unclear where we have different populations of, sorry, of multivesicular endosomes. Uh, one that is fated for secretion, another one that is fated for degradation with lysosomes, but one has to think that in the cell everything is very dynamic, and if cells, I mean, do depict multivesicular endosomes that are prone for secretion, of course they will adapt and they will exploit the machinery that is necessary for fusion with the plasma membrane and not for fusion with the lysosome. So you have these, then these vesicles that are called exosomes, but as indicated here in my scheme, we have this microvesicle that bud from the plasma membrane. And here is from a review that we wrote with Guillaume Vanille and Gisela D'Angelo in 2018, um, where indeed, I mean, we have uh, depicted, I mean, the different names that they have been used for exosomes or for microvesicles. I generally call collectively the microvesicle vesicles that bud from the plasma membrane, but of course you have, I mean, the large oncosomes, you have microparticles, blabbing vesicles, shedding vesicles, uh, migrosomes, apoptotic bodies, and uh, there is a very different uh, uh, nomenclatures that uh, have been uh, used, I mean, according to their origin size and morphology. So this is just an EM uh, to, to show how uh, one can observe vesicles really budding from the, the plasma membrane. And they, you have here on the upper panel, uh, massive budding, this is in the breast cancer uh, cell line. This was from a study that we did in collaboration with Crislin de Souza Scurry, uh, and uh, showing that indeed uh, metalloproteases were associated with these large uh, vesicles that bud from the plasma membrane. And on the lower panel, you can see here another example of exocytic fusion, release of these endosome derived vesicles, and then the isolated vesicles observed by electron microscopy, but this is not cry microscopy, so the vesicles appear a little bit like this cup shape. And on the upper panel, you have larger vesicles also observed uh, by electron microscopy after uh, isolation. One thing is that, um, that I would like to come is due to, to the fact that, of course, you have these vesicles that are released from the plasma membrane, you have the vesicles that are released from endosomes. I mean, you, all these vesicles can, can mix when uh, we isolate them from the supernatants, depending on the cells. Some cells release both, some cells release more vesicles from the plasma membrane and more from the endosome. And this is why sometimes it's very difficult to to, to separate them. But uh, here, what I would like to notice with this electron microscopy here is that this is in a, in a B lymphocyte. And you can see here that it, within the multivesicular body, so this is a labeling for MHE class two, the large gold particles and CD63. So this tetraspanning that we know that is very enriched into these intraluminal vesicles. So what you see here, is that you have larger vesicles, smaller vesicles. So within multivesicular endosomes, the vesicles are heterogeneous in size and also in composition. And you see here on the lower panel, on this inset, an exocytic profile with these clumps of vesicles, and they are also very heterogeneous. So what it is secreted from the endosome is, uh, is not one single vesicle, and I think that all these vesicles, they, have, they may have a different uh, composition and then to, to really isolate them, separate them. I mean, one can really wonder whether 
even the vesicles do not work together uh, like I mean in like with clumps and uh, of course I mean uh, as we know I mean there's this important protein like tetrin that was shown by the by James Edgar while in the the team of uh, Scotty Robinson that this tetrin may tether all these vesicles tightly together and they are released sometimes as clusters. So uh, how to really show that uh, these vesicles um, are arising from an endosomal compartment? And here I would like to, to come back, I mean, to the studies of uh, Frederic uh, Verve. I mean, uh, and he started these studies while with Michael Tegdell at AMC Amsterdam. Uh, during this postdoc, so we made this construct, the uh, CD63 coupled uh, to pH fluorine. So, with me, which means that this CD63 uh, that is coupled to this uh, pH fluorine is only fluorescent when it is outside, because it is the, the fluorescence, of course, is quenched by the acidity of uh, the multivesicular endosome. So what Fred uh, did here, so he did TIRF microscopy, and you can see here in this movie, these uh, blumps uh, of uh, fluorescence, and over these blumps of fluorescence, we were able to look by electron microscopy using correlative light electron microscopy, and what we could see here by a tomographic reconstruction is that these spots really correspond to spots of endosomal fusion. So this is one of the proof that these vesicles are really arising from these endosomal internal compartments. So uh, Fred, together with Guillaume Vanil, uh, while in Curie, and now they are at the Institute of Neuroscience in Paris, uh, what they, what Fred and Guillaume showed really nicely was that uh, this pH fluorine, the CDC3 pH fluorine, once expressed in zebrafish embryos, was really localized into the yolk, as you see here in green. And then uh, with electron microscopy, you can see here the red blood cells. And what you'll see here in the inset is that all these vesicles that are CD63 positive correspond to these EVs, to these exosomes. And using this system, I would really recommend uh, reading this paper because you can really see the vesicles into the flow and uh, FRET could inhibit the production of these, uh, of these vesicles. And it could really uh, somehow study the fate and the role of these vesicles using uh, this model uh, organism. So I think it's one of the ways to try to start really studying the role and uh, more of the molecular mechanisms that are involved in the, in the secretion and in the fate of uh, these vesicles is using these model organisms. So uh, basically, uh, it's true that uh, these extracellular vesicles interact with recipient cells. And uh, this question has been asked for many years is how these micro vesicles from the plasma membrane and how these endosomal derived vesicles, how do they, how do they interact with their recipient cells? Because they are great ways of uh, intercellular communication. They have proteins, they have lipids, they have genetic material as also uh, depicted here in this model. And so these vesicles, I mean, they can either fuse with the plasma membrane. I think there are some evidences for that, but uh, they can still stay just docked. And again, there are many examples uh, in, uh, in the literature showing that the vesicles can just uh, stay docked at the plasma membrane, or they are internalized and then they are then uh, targeted to an endosomal compartment. And maybe by uh, what we so call this process of back fusion with the limiting membrane, like here, you can 
uh, release into the cytosol uh, the contents like the genetic material or maybe other cytosolic contents that is present uh, into the vesicles. In, in, co in concern to the, to the mechanisms of biogenesis, as I said, I mean, the contents of the multivesicular endosome is extremely heterogeneous, and we know now that there are several mechanisms that are involved in the formation in these vesicles and uh, to, to somehow select and sort the different cargos that may be present in the limiting membrane of the endosome and that you want to target to these intraluminal vesicles. So if in the beginning, in around 2008, there was a paper from the team of uh, Mika Simons uh, in science showing that the, we, we really don't need these so-called escort uh, components. Escort is endosomal sorting complex responsible for transport. It was shown in East to be involved in the formation of these intraluminal vesicles. But in their case, for the targeting of the proteolipid PLP in oligodendrocytes, there was a need for the production of serenades. We also know that there are not other non-escort uh, mechanisms that involved the formation of tetraspanins, that involved tetraspanin domains, though there are still uh, uh, requirements for escorts for the targeting of certain cargos. So basically, I mean, uh, it's still, I would say, uh, complex because one, it's very difficult to really inhibit the formation of uh, all types of vesicles by just using one, uh, by targeting just one uh, mechanism or another. I mean, yesterday I was discussing quite with Carolina, for example, and I was just saying, I think that is very pretty much cargo uh, driven. It depends on the cargo that is going to, to drive a certain that needs a certain machinery to be targeted to to the endosomal compartment these may be very dependent on the on the model uh, in concern to the to microvesicles again different mechanisms have been uh, described like uh, actin escorts also rf6 but again many others and for the secretion, we know that uh, there are reports showing that the uh, small GPTPases like uh, RAB27, RAB11, or RAB35 are also involved in this secretion process. I mean, whether they are really involved in the fusion, I mean, is unclear because you certainly need uh, snare proteins. And there's one snare like uh, Wake IT6 that have been shown to be important for the secretion of winglets. But uh, I still that uh, we are still far from really understanding what is the fusion machinery that is necessary uh, for the secretion of multivesicular endosomes with the plasma membrane, but we can discuss it at the end. So again, this is just a cartoon that I took from our, one of our reviews with uh, Phil Stahl. So here you have a, a couple of mechanisms that are necessary for the formation of microvesicles from the membrane. And you can see here again, this electron microscopy uh, of budding at the plasma membrane. You see here the different mechanisms, tetraspanins, escort one, I mean, and TSG101 have been shown, uh, escort three, uh, but we also need ceramide or n cytoskeleton and tetraspanins. And here on the lower panel, you see uh, an electron microscopy that I took from a review that I, I wrote with uh, uh, Judith Klumperman uh, from UMC Utrecht, where you see very nicely this intraluminal uh, budding of the, um, of, the ves of the intraluminal vesicles and the machinery that is needed for that. I mean, as I told you just in the, in the, the slide before, Again, it's pretty much dependent uh, on the cargo. So you have ceramide, you have tetraspanins, we have this protein synthenin that was shown by the team of Pascal Zimmermann. 
So again, as you see, it's, uh, we are still in the complex picture and, uh, and I need that. I, I really think that uh, more studies using different models and comparative studies are needed to understand a little bit better uh, the machineries that are involved and that could be targeted to inhibit the sorting of one component that could be really important in a certain process in a cell. So just now to the end, uh, uh, it's true that as I said, I mean, we have started with immunity. Uh, of course, we have, we have done a lot of work also, I mean, on the, the role of uh, uh, exosomes and EVs in the spreading of pathogens and how also how uh, uh, really, for example, virus infection can be really increased the amounts of uh, vesicles that are released and vesicles that carry uh, viral proteins. But one process that I got really interesting, uh, interested many, uh, almost 20 years ago, is the process of pigmentation. And why the process of pigmentation? Because, um, as you see here in this model, so on one way you have these secretory uh, multivesicular bodies, but we have all these uh, list of lysosome related organelles and the MHE class two compartments are part of it. And these melanosomes that are involved in pigmentation appear to me very, very interesting. Very interesting because, I mean, they are generated by melanocytes in the in the basis of the epidermis and these melanosomes that you can see here in the melanocyte, they are then transferred to the neighboring keratinocytes. So you can see here, and you know that the skin is a, is a wonderful, I mean, is the largest uh, organ that we have and is a, it covers all our bodies, a great barrier against pathogens. And it's really, its role is really to, of course, give color, but also give photoprotection against ionizing radiations. And this is the main role of, of the pigments. So, but this is a very controlled process. So, I mean, this is under the sun, you have hormones, uh, rose factors, soluble factors, you have these induces signal transduction pathways, you have then melanocyte pigmentation, and you can see here isolated melanocytes with these very dark organelles, you have the melanin transfer and skin pigmentation. Though we knew, I mean, already from many years that soluble factors secreted by these keratinocytes on the upper layers are very important. And when we start looking at the soluble factors, many of these soluble factors, many of these soluble factors, they could not be just soluble because they appear to be membrane associated. So when we had uh, a great postdoc, Alessandro Lotisser, who came to the lab uh, about in 2012, uh, we start wondering, I mean, this was really a joker, you know, because I say a joker because uh, we didn't have any primary data. I mean, we knew that maybe keratinocytes could secrete dissolvable factors, whether they could really secrete vesicles, it was very unclear. So here, what you see is that what uh, Alessandra did is that she showed that here keratinocytes that appear here in red, labeled by tubulin, you see here G G CD63 GFP. But when we do co-cultures with the melanocytes, and here is a melanocyte, here is a keratinocyte, you see that all the, G the CD63 uh, GFP that is uh, present in the keratinocyte is then somehow clustered to the site of contacts. And here on the lower panel, you have a reconstructed epidermis with the melanocyte, the keratinocyte. And what we have, we have the sort of redistribution of these multivesicular endosomes, like here on the bottom. And these multivesicular endosomes, they are very, very close to the sites of contacts with the melanocytes. So Alessandra took primary melanocytes, primary keratinocytes, she isolated exosomes from uh, these primary keratinocytes, I mean, from different phototypes. And then she, she put them in contact with the melanocytes to see whether there is any uh, function on the melanocyte. 
And again, to get a long story short, because this was published, so what Alessandra showed, I mean, using these different uh, uh, keratinocytes of different origin, uh, she showed that you have these multivesicular endosomes that fuse with the plasma membrane of the keratinocyte and that release the vesicle. These vesicles then modulate pigmentation in the melanocyte. And they modulate pigmentation in a way that they increase tyrosinase activity, uh, they increase RAF27A, which is a pigmentation gene that is under the control of MITF, the main transcription factor, and also increase tyrosinase activity. So of course, this was extremely interesting. And uh, we also show that there are particular microRNAs that are uh, encapsulated in these uh, exosomes and these microRNAs are really important uh, to, uh, I mean, one of the microRNAs, by the way, was one of the targets is tyrosinase. Other microRNAs, I mean, have other targets also, but still when we use, when we, uh, when we inactivated these microRNAs with the uh, antimers, then these exosomes were not able anymore to modulate melanocyte pigmentation. So, so far so good. And I think that we in the, in the team, I mean, we do pursue uh, studies on uh, uh, using the skin. And uh, I think that uh, if keratinocytes do secrete uh, exosomes, melanocytes also secrete exosomes, and certainly other extracellular vesicles, and we are now pretty much interested in continuing using this system to really understand this crosstalk, you know, that can use, can be used, I mean, in a homeostatic basis to uh, maintain pigmentation, to maintain the skin, but also very interesting how all these can be really perturbed, I mean, in uh, pigmentary disorders, I mean, including, of course, uh, melanoma. I mean, just to say that, uh, I mean, this cross, these crosstalks, I mean, between cells, I mean, using these new modes of intercellular communication. I mean, I just took uh, one model, I mean, the, from, a, from a paper by, uh, by Bavisoto in 2019 on how this uh, intercellular communication in the central nervous system can be important, maybe uh, for good, but also for bad, because there is maybe also uh, a role in the, uh, in the progression of these neurological diseases and astrocytes, microglia, neurons, oligodendrocytes, all day they can, they, of course, they communicate through direct contact, but they communicate also uh, via extracellular vesicles. So uh, basically, I mean, this is my end slide. I'm sorry if I've been a little bit long, but uh, of course I'm, I'm always, I mean, very grateful to, uh, to Phil Stahl uh, at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. I mean, with whom we are always in contact and thinking a lot and uh, thinking really on how EVs fit into or supplement this uh, physiological signaling system that we can find in these multicellular organisms. What is really the role of EVs in, I mean, in communication, in homeostasis, what the role of EVs compared to other modes of communication. But still, I mean, I would like, of course, as uh, in cell biology, I still that, although, I mean, we know now that these EVs can be used in diagnosis, they can use, they can be used in clinical trials. I mean, it's still, I mean, we, we really, there is still much space to really understand better uh, the mechanistics and uh, to, that are really involved in the, in the formation of these vesicles and try the best models uh, to do that. And uh, this is the end. Uh, so, of course, I mean, I can't uh, stop this webinar without thanking all the team. I mean, uh, a great, great team uh, uh, working on pigmentation, working on EVs. 
uh, it's always very stimulating. And uh, of course, uh, Guillaume Vanille, Fred Vervey, that uh, are already, already for two years in the Institute of Neuroscience, but we always discuss a lot. Of course, Roberta Palmuli just finished her uh, PhD uh, last end of last year in the team. I mean, she was working with Guillaume Vanille and myself. And uh, I'm sure she's maybe on the other side of the box. So I'd like to say happy birthday for yesterday, Roberta. And uh, I wish you the best because you are now in a great lab. We are in Cambridge. You went to Cambridge just in the beginning. I mean, it was just before the confinement. So, but I'm sure that you're going to take the best from a great postdoc in Cambridge together in the team of Dr. James Edgar. And uh, so I wish you uh, all the best. And my last slide is for my primary hexosome team, the team of Hans Reuser in Utrecht, where I went in 1993. And of course, Willem Storval at the University uh, of Utrecht and now in the veterinary school. And I'm finished. Thank you so much, uh, Grasa. Uh, it, it's always great to uh, to interact with you and to listen to you. Thank you so much. Um, before before we start the questions and answers, uh, I would like to emphasize that ICEV 2020 is not cancelled. Uh, it's not cancelled. Okay. It's not cancelled, but we're not meeting face to face. Okay. <clears throat> I'll, I'll put in the chat in the chat now the link to the interactive meeting that we're planning for July this year. Uh, so it will be a web-based meeting, but it will be uh, quite comprehensive and detailed. So uh, I, hope you, um, I hope you join us for, for this meeting. We actually expected a lot of people to attend uh, through, through this uh, route, route. So um, that would be, that would be right. excellent. And, Thank you very much, Gaza. So I think there were there are a number of questions in the chat, and you can unmute yourself when you ask a question. So Sharif uh, had a question about safety. Sharif um, Ibrahim. Be before that, could I please before ask that? Grasa to stop the screen share? Yeah, stop the screen okay. share. Yeah. Yes, thank you. And then we can see everybody. Oh yeah. Sharif Ibrahim. I see. So he was asking a question. If uh, I can see you trying to unmute yourself, but I'll, I'll unmute you if you can't do that. Now you, uh, yeah, now you can speak, Sheriff. If you have a microphone, maybe you don't have a microphone. Anyway, we no? can't hear you. At least I can't hear you. Anyway, you asked about the safety of extracellular vesicles in clinical trials. Do you want to? Discuss that, Grasa. You've been doing some uh, clinical trials in cancer, uh, or been involved indirectly at least. So, could you comment on that? I mean, for the moment, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not a physician myself, but of course, uh, there were clinical trials. There were different phases, you know, phase one, phase two. So, in the in the first phases of the clinical trials that were that were done and that were published, by the way. So there is all the tests of uh, cytotoxicity. Uh, so there was all the, all, everything has been done for the, to implement the clinical trial. So there is safety. Uh, of course it's safe and uh, it's GMP produced. And uh, now they are being used. They have been using it as adjuvants, you know, in uh, immunotherapy, for example, to simulate anti anti-tumoral immune responses. Uh, of course, I mean, I think one consideration that I would have as cell biologists is that, for example, I mean, one can wonder whether, uh, you know, if you take dendritic cells. Uh, from a patient, I mean, suffering uh, from cancer, you know, the, the vesicles that will be produced, of course, they are characterized. But are these vesicles, I mean, do they have enough uh, MHC molecules? Do they have enough co-stimulatory molecules? Are the vesicles changed? But uh, this is the only question that I would ask myself as cell yeah. biologist. 
but still so, all the tests all this all the safety all the safety tests have been done yes so i agree with that and, and but the big question is i guess when we produce a a vesicular therapeutics and and kodiak biosciences in massachusetts in cambridge massachusetts are pushing for clinical trials starting hopefully at least next this year or maybe next year because of the of the delay in clinical trials and also evox in um, uh, in, uh, in, in Oxford, UK, are pushing for clinical trials within the next few years. So they will, they will have a lot of safety data. The other argument that they're safe is that every time we do a blood transfusion in any hospital throughout the world, there is, um, there, there is uh, a, a lot of vesicles being transmitted as well. So overall, there seems to be, see, there are many arguments to suggest that there's good safety there. But we don't know whether engineered vesicles would be safe or not. not. So, uh, Nawaz Mohammed, you want to ask a question? Thank you so much. I think uh, Nawaz uh, said that he's leaving uh, because he has other. Right. So he was asking about the changing pH, whether that uh, in endosomes and that uh, could help in any way in in vesicle trafficking. Yes, I mean it's. Uh, I mean it has been shown in the paper in eLife by James Edgar, you know, a paper on the tetrin. Uh, so it has been shown. It has been shown that indeed, if we neutralize uh, endosomes, we we do stimulate uh, the secretion of vesicles. So I guess because uh, when you use these agents like. Um, uh, like bufilomycin or concanamycin that uh, block VATPases, so you neutralize these endosomes, and these endosomes then then will be more prone for fusion. So I think that I would guess. I mean, this is again a guess, is that we need um, one of the signals to give to the cell to give to the endosome uh, that he needs to to be. Um, that is prone for secretion is that you need a neutral pH because uh, I remember when um, when I start working I mean on the on this subject one of the questions was yeah but how uh, a cell can deal with a local acidity that will be delivered by the endosome mm -hmm. if the endosome is fusing but I think that these endosomes that fuse they they may be neutral so neutralizing the endosome uh, is certainly uh, one way that can uh, increase the release of uh, of vesicles, and uh, in the paper in real life, uh, this was described. Did Thank I answer you. the question? Yeah. Any other question? So I don't see any new questions on the chat box, but you can put it there, and then you—that's like holding up your hand. Can I ask you what your thinking is around subpopulation of vesicles based on their um, on the contribution of different uh, different intracellular compartments like mitochondria or or Golgi apparatus or ER and and how that influences I mean, thinking about extracellular vesicles in general? I mean the thing. I mean th then it's a question of um, orientation also. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? Because uh, vesicles that are derived from the plasma membrane or from endosomes, they have the same orientation as the plasma membrane, basically. Mm -hmm. Because the vesicles that are formed within the endosome, they are formed by inward budding, so they have the, uh, the same orientation. But vesicles that are derived from mitochondria, they they should not have the same orientation, isn't it? Because well, uh, I, I, yeah, uh, there are there are reports of different uh, so Golgi it's not the same ER orientation. Proteins. So the lipids, the lipids will and, be different. Yeah, the lipids would be different. For example, but they co-isolate in our exosome isolates, right? They end up in the same yeah. pellet. Yes. 
I mean, normally, uh, normally the the same lipid should not be exposed. I don't know about uh, phosphatidyl serine, for example, PS. Mm -hmm. PS is normally not exposed at at the external leaflet of mm -hmm. endosome derived vesicles. You know, they cannot be isolated by an exim five, for example. This was shown for platelets many years ago that microvesicles that are, are normally phosphatidyl serine positive, they can be trapped using an exim 5 whereas endosome derived CD63 positive vesicles, this was shown in, uh, in platelets by uh, the team of Hans Reus, I mean, when I was still there. And uh, the phosphatidyl serine uh, is not exposed but uh, so maybe this could be a way to to discriminate is to find the uh, different lipids because of course as you say i mean all these vesicles they co-isolate they co-isolate but somehow one can wonder whether these vesicles can uh, somehow work together or not you know is it really important to really discriminate uh, you know, all these different vesicles to have one single population of vesicle and not an heterogeneous population. These are questions that one can wonder. You know, yeah, we, and it's just was, an exciting um, field and trying to dig into that, so. Uh, no, this is, uh, this is really, uh, it's true, it's, uh, it's totally open because if we do immunoisolation, if you think on immunoisolation, as has been done with, uh, for example, with beads using uh, uh, trapping with particular antibodies, we use beads, I mean, uh, with CD63, and then the beads, uh, the beads, they, they just uh, uh, trap the CD63 positive vesicles, mm -hmm. but then are we really trapping the only population that is really important? If I see the vesicle that carries CD63 and the vesicle they carry MHC class 2, I have double labeled vesicles, but vesicles that label for MHC class 2 are CD63. So I'm going to enrich maybe for a population and uh, leave the other one aside. So yeah, exactly. So they have, may have different uh, function, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Or they function together. They need to function together. So in real life, that's what they do, right? In real life, this is what they do, and this is an explanation of why, you know, maybe uh, in some uh, some cells you have this protein tethering that is tethering vesicles together, vesicles that are heterogeneous, and that maybe cooperate together to uh, to for their needs. I would say. I'll come back to Carolina in a little moment, but we have a really interesting question from Nishta uh, Bargava about isolation and whether um, differential ultracentrification steps. Uh, are you there, Nisha? Yes. You, Hi, here. Yeah. Please Hi. ask the Hi, question. Sir. Yeah, there you are. Yes, yeah. Hello. Uh, thank you. This was a very refreshing talk after a while <laughs> during the lockdown. Um, I still really want to know, I'm working with, I'm trying to work with exosomes. I've tried a couple of isolation methods. Um, uh, I do imagine that it is, prob differential ultracentrification has been the gold standard for a long time. But uh, people, practitioners do agree that it is probably the most tedious method. Uh, so. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. So I still wanted to know from you whether you really consider it still to be the best method out there to really isolate exosomes. You know, as, as I would say, I mean, there is no best method. You know, there is always compromises. There is um, uh, all the methods have their pros and cons, I would say. I mean, uh, you can, you know, there are can use size exclusion chromatography. You can use, there are many other methods that are maybe easier, but then you, you really need to complement uh, with additional methods uh, of characterization. But it's true that size exclusion chromatography, also we are working, we're trying to do a lot of, uh, a lot of, de of developments are, 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 do, are done now using microfluidics, for example, 
And I mean, uh, I'm sure that maybe at the high set there will be talks on all these isolation methods. But then, I mean, for example, using size equation chromatography, uh, one of the problems that we can have is that uh, then the samples are a little bit too diluted. So, for example, if you want to look at them by EM, uh, mm -hmm. it has been very difficult to look at them by EM. So, again, I mean, I think you one need to take all these techniques, you know, and see, okay, what is suitable for my study because your outcome will depend from that. Right. But you need to have this minimum of characterization. It's true that all this integration is extremely tedious. It's tedious many, if you want to tell me. As, yeah, as many of you know, I am the editor in chief of Journal for Exercise of Exercise yeah. Vesicles. And uh, from a matter of quality, uh, we do not accept uh, papers that only use a kit to isolate yeah. extracellular vesicles. They have to try some other methods, including ultracentrification, um, uh, flotation, for example, um, density gradient uh, centrification is, is proving to become a very interesting way of, of, of separating different subsets of vesicles, and we're learning a lot from that. So, Exactly like Rasa says, it depends on 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 the goal with your study. But if you if you you could use poly polyethylene glucol and optimize that, yeah. there are you can clearly get a lot of extracellular vesicle with polyethylene glucol on this quick yeah. short centrifugation. But it isolates many 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 yes, other things. Exactly. And and you would, that paper would not be accepted or would be not mm -hmm. be considered uh, in in Jev unless you compared with other other methods. methods. So, yeah. but, but clearly uh, the journal is really keen on getting a really good quality comparison of mm -hmm. the different isolation methods and, and the quality of the, uh, of the vesicles that you isolate from them and the different characteristics that may, they may have. So if anybody's out there, push for that and you have time and, and, okay. and capacity, please do that study and consider your jab. So oh, okay. there I yeah. can promote the journal <laughs> yeah. a little bit as well. <laughs> there, there have been there have been comparative papers earlier. There have um, been some, yeah. Yeah, but I don't think anyone has been so comprehensive about it. No, exactly. Yeah, you know, okay. it's because I, I think it always depends. I mean, again, you know, you can um, it depends. You know, you may have uh, large volumes. You may have large volumes mm -hmm. with. Not enough vesicles. I think again, yes. and the quantification is extremely difficult per se to really right. have something really quantitative. And sometimes you can hand, you have to handle tons of uh, exactly uh, culture. I work with yes, I work with ten culture dishes at a time when it is really difficult, and you know the yeah. time lapse also adds to the errors in the uh, no, output. no, absolutely. I mean, Absolutely, but yeah. I mean, for example, in the Dev Cell paper, uh, Frederic Verve, he, yeah. he managed to isolate uh, vesicles from uh, zebrafish, and now right. and even to do proteomics with a very very small amount. I think maybe Fred is in the is in the audience, and Fred can tell you how many fish he needed to to do this study. Yes, that would be helpful. <laughs> or I'll look at his paper then. Okay. Aaron is here as well. He's doing a fish, so yes, Aaron is somewhere. Thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Nista. So, uh, and what? Follow-up yes. question. Just one quick one, right? Okay. Yeah, just no. It was just a comment that uh, working with proteins which cannot be uh, for like miRNA or DNA, it becomes difficult with the yield being very little. That is all. You need to use large volumes. For your uh, when you're studying EVs, you need yes. cell from cell culture. Yes. You do yeah, need you, large volumes. That's you clear. Need large volumes. You need large right. amounts of uh, of right. vesicles. I mean, for example, now we are doing uh, a lot of proteomics or lipidomics, and you you do need large volumes. And don't forget that you you need to culture cells. If the cells can be cultured in mediums without serum, is nice. I mean, for example, we use primary cells that don't need serum because we have special uh, mediums. 
but uh, you can't forget to to really uh, remove these the vesicles that are present already in the serum, in the fetal right. serum. Right. No, so it's it's true. It's uh, it's not easy, but again, I mean, uh, the kids. Uh, this is just precipitation, so it's. Uh, I would avoid some it. some of them are fairly specific for certain surface markers like uh, yeah. Yeah, proteins on the surface and we will move on we'll move on yeah. and uh, we'll go over to Carolina who had a question uh, about melanosomes go ahead yeah, Carolina. Um, yeah sorry I think I'm just going to rephrase my question so uh, I'm interested to that uh, interaction between um, melanocytes and keratinocytes and how the pigment is being transferred so is there sort of like similarity in the melanosomes in the uh, in the melanocytes and keratinocytes? I mean, have you sort of like compared them whether they are like uh, same proteins, even though it's two different cell types? And um, is there any sort of like uh, difference between those? Or, um, so, mm, sorry. Uh, let me see. So normally, uh, I mean, the, these are the very different cell types. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, you know, these uh, these uh, melanosomes. Uh, I mean, most studies point to that there is exocytosis of the content of the melanosome, and the content of the melanosome. So there is melanin, packed mm -hmm. melanin. So there are also, of course, there are there is this pack of melanins. Of course, there are also some lipids. And normally, then they are uh, phagocytosed mm -hmm. by the keratinocyte. The keratinocyte, I mean, of course, these are cells of very different nature. You know, it's neural crest versus the epithelial cells. But then the the keratinocyte is somehow educated to handle these uh, these melanosomes. But of course, I mean, it is a bit. You can make some parallels. Of course, a melanosome is very different from an exosome. Mm. Uh, but still you can make some parallels because these uh, melanosomes is what is secreted, at least what is secreted is devoid of membrane and is transferred to the keratinocyte and again it's going to to give a communication signal to this uh, keratinocyte after the transfer. Oh, okay, so uh, it's, it's really like the whole sort of intracellular organelle being secreted, the melanosomes? Yeah, or... uh, it's oh, uh, okay. without the membrane, without the membrane. Oh, without the membrane. Uh, yeah. One last question, one last question. We're approaching one and a half hours, and I think that's what uh, people's uh, attention span is at maximum. <laughs> Uh, uh, firstly, and I just put a link. Coffee time, coffee time, coffee time for some. Soon, coffee time for us all. Uh, I put a link on a on a podcast I did with Grasa uh, a few uh, two weeks ago now, I think. That's up on YouTube, and yeah. it's basically yeah. a dialogue about Grasa's journey. So please go there and listen to her more personal uh, reflections on on the discovery of. Oh no! Of, please uh, no. Immunoactive no. vesicles, right? <laughs> We, it was fun. So, uh, Sharad, uh, Kolia, uh, please uh, unmute yourself and, and ask your question. This will be the last question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, a really nice talk. Uh, I just have a, a question of curiosity. Uh, basically, can EVs, uh, once released uh, from uh, the cells, pick up any biologically active cargo? in the extracellular environment. And if the methods of purification and isolation that we currently use um, either have an effect on the biological activity by removing or dampening these biological cargo. Um, let me see if I got really the question. <clears throat> so you so have if, if the isolation procedures damage the vesicles, basically that's yeah. a question, Sharad, right? Yeah. If if the isolation yeah, procedure uh, damage, of course you lose your you lose your uh, your biologic activity. So you really need to be uh, extremely careful in a you know if you really want to study the function. I mean, you you really need to avoid uh, freezing and freezing. And uh, normally, when you isolate, then you use them fresh to to test your your activity of course 
I mean, keeping uh, vesicles in a tube or in the minus 80 uh, for long. I mean, this will restructure our activity. So if you don't see an activity, it can be maybe due to the fact that it's just not active. So clearly, ultra centrifugation, you still have uh, bioactive exosomes in your, yeah. in your pellet. And that's even when there's an ultra centrifugation with 100,000 G, the, the angle of the, of the rotors, usually there's an angle, and the vesicles will hit the side of the tube and mm -hmm. roll down and create a pellet at the, uh, at the side of the bottom of the, of the tube, as many of you have, have seen. And, and you can imagine with 100,000 G that that would, could potentially cause some damage. Still, they are biologically active. So conceptually, probably the, the, the uh, softest way of doing it would be do a, a, um, a uh, what do you call it, um, a, a swinging bucket rotor that can go oh, out yeah. to 90 no, degrees for approximately. Sure, for sure. No, 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 but not, Please. let me finish, let me finish. And then you have a cushion, density gradient, or cushion that the vesicles uh, end up at, and they would not be hitting the bottom or the plastic. So that's conceptually probably the, the friendliest way of doing it. Do you agree, Grasa? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, and again, you have to be extremely careful on the rotor, the tubes that you use. You know, it, it, it is, uh, I think that the tubes, for example, I'll give you an example. For example, uh, when you use, uh, so we use generally these uh, swinging rotors, uh, as Jan said, but then you, what you do is that there is these polypropylene tubes or there is these ultra pure. The ultra pure tubes, uh, we had problems with the ultra pure tubes, you know, because the vesicles, they stick and uh, to these ultra pure, uh, so-called these ultra, ultra pure, um, uh, uh, plastic tubes for the swinging rotors, and then you can just not remove it. So the, the quality of the tubes is also very important. I think, uh, I mean, these, uh, the different rotors are maybe described in a paper in Nature Methods or Nature Protocols, if, uh, if I'm not wrong. And, yeah, uh, we, we did a study the, back in 2013 or 14, yes. I think, where we established in JEV. Yes, the so, I think so there's really, a lot of discussion around this. Uh, at the in the mice of guidelines as well from 2018. So yeah, the, the, I recommend the rotors, everyone to, to uh, look at that. That, that you use, but it's true that the, the cushions is really good. And of course, when we use uh, gradients, uh, sucrose or percol uh, to isolate the the fractions, it's also very important, of course, to remove the sucrose and the percol before uh, indeed testing your EVs. Because the so I'll, 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 I'll give an insight to, to the audience here. Many people uh, have issues with functionality after they've isolated the vesicles with sucrose, where, there's, where there is, whereas there is my maintained biological activity if you isolate with iodixonal density gradient. Yeah. So of some reason, and if you look at the literature, there are very few studies on, on sucrose, um, and, and a biological function. They're beautiful for, for analytics and for uh, e EM and stuff like that, right? But functionality, people seem to have issues with that. I don't think that's been published as, a, as an observation, actually. Uh, hey, and, and Aaron put up the paper there and he'll put up another few papers. So Grasa, we love yes. you. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. I like this okay. format because it is uh, not limited by time. You don't have a 30 minute slot, uh, slot that you have to end uh, after five minutes of discussion. We've kept on going for one and a half hour plus now, which is fantastic and we could continue, but I think many of us are, are getting a little bit uh, tired and we need our coffee and you need your coffee. I but, need my so, coffee, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So thank and you so much. And some need to go to bed maybe, I don't know, but <laughs> you know. <laughs> Take a nap, you can do that now in these crazy days. And uh, yes. thank you so much. And thank you for everyone yes. who stayed for and the whole stay session. Safe. And, stay safe. and and thank yeah. you, Carolina, for arranging this. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. thank you, Carolina. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Thank you.